You are listening to CEO Perspectives, a podcast by the Conference Board. Welcome to this episode of CEO Perspectives, a signature webcast and podcast series by the Conference Board. CEO Perspectives take an objective, nonpartisan look at a range of timely topics that matter most to business leaders. In this series, we'll sit down with thought leaders and do what we do best at the Conference Board, provide insights for what's ahead. I'm Steve Odlin, the CEO of the Conference Board and the host of this series. And in today's conversation, we're gonna discuss the trends on the minds of business leaders and workers alike, and that is hybrid work as executives decide how to manage their return to offices after two years of remote work, many are turning to a hybrid model as the answer. But what's the best way to do this? How do you provide flexibility while also maintaining culture in the company? Joining me today is Dr. Rebecca Ray, a leading voice on the workforce and the workplace. She is the leader of the Human Capital Center here at the Conference Board. Rebecca, welcome. Thank you, Steve. It's a pleasure to be with you. So Rebecca, I think to start, we should probably dial back the clock a couple of years pre-COVID. Just describe the pre-pandemic workplace. I mean, people may not even remember it's been so long ago. What, what were the best practices and the issues then? And now, how has the pandemic changed things? Well, if, if only we could turn the, the clock back, right, Steve? So, you know, I, I think the world of work seemed to be on kind of a regular pace, you know, there would be technological improvements, there would be improvements in terms of the technology with which workers could get their work done. But it seemed to be a fairly measured pace. And it seemed to be on track toward, you know, some future nirvana. But I think a couple of things are going to be part of the lasting legacy of the pandemic, the social change and economic challenges of the past couple of years. You know, pendulum swings, um, usually even out over time, but four things I think are permanently changed. The first one is the workplace itself. When so many knowledge workers were able to work from home at the onset of the pandemic, you know, technology enabled workers to remain productive. And we all know of companies who struggle, but we also know of many who turned in their, their best years ever. Zoom fatigue uh, certainly takes its toll, but in the minds of many workers, it's not enough to warrant a return to the workplace as, as we once thought we knew it. And you know, the longer the pandemic dragged on, the more people figured out how to put their lives together so that they could address personal challenges as, as well as keep working together. So I, I, think, I think there's a real change here. And the longer it lasted, the more people became used to that new normal, if you will. So as corporate executives look to bring workers back to the workplace, we're seeing a lot of resistance. And there's a variety of good reasons to be physically in the workplace. You and I have talked about these quite often, including you know, relationship building, preserving the culture, professional development, especially for those who are earlier in career. But I think companies very largely missed the mark when it comes to articulating a compelling case for a return to the physical workplace. Yeah. So, you know, when, when we talk about this workplace, I mean, some people laugh because, you know, not everybody can do their work hybrid, right? I mean, you, you can't construct the building, you know, using a, a, a Zoom call. I, you know, any idea how prevalent, you know, this situation is throughout the American workforce? I, I think it's a sea change, actually. And even in those instances where uh, it's necessary to be in a physical workplace, I think there's gonna be a lot of pressure to think about it differently. And even in those instances where let's say you're on a manufacturing line or you're providing uh, healthcare services or you are serving customers in some way, uh, there's going to be a, a lot of pressure to have uh, teams take a look at, uh, at the way in which they could still get the work done. You know, I, I recognize there's a critical need to deliver the business results, but organizations are going to need to help their teams feel empowered to make the decisions that enable them to get the maximum efficiency so that they can be agile, so that they can be flexible, so that they can take care of each other. And this may look like staggered or asynchronous schedules. It may look like job sharing. It's certainly going to call for the reclassification of job roles. And as workers find that they can demand these things and have the opportunity to go elsewhere if they don't get them, uh, companies will need to, to start providing those in thoughtful ways or run the risk of losing good talent. So what I hear you saying is we're not going back to the pre-COVID days. Whatever the normal was then, 
which was, you know, normally in the, you know, people were coming to the office five days a week and, you know, whatever. That's not going to come back. So it, it is, even if you're in, you know, a service oriented environment, it's going to change. That's what I hear you saying. And that change is going to be permanent, right? I think so. I think that we're going to be in a hybrid sort of mixed environment for a long time. And I think it will probably take some fits and starts and we won't get everything right, but we'll continue to learn and we'll evolve. But I don't think that the returning to the way things were is, is even possible. Much what less hybrid, so, so what does hybrid mean to you? Is, does it mean that everybody kind of does their own thing or that there are set schedules of, you know, work in the office, work from home? You know, how should employers think about that? So let's let's talk about hybrid just for a moment. I think you know a lot of us use it sort of interchangeably, but I think it's sort of a code word for flexibility. So that means you might have a hybrid environment where people are looking to get a, a series of jobs done. Some might maybe remote completely, some in the office completely, some in some kind of a two or three day, sometimes one day uh, approach. But it also means hybrid workers, you may have a variety of types of worker now in the workplace, much more so than before. Many people are reevaluating, rethinking whether or not full-time employment in the more traditional sense that we've perhaps uh, thought about in these last few decades, that doesn't work for them. They may shift to part-time or gig work, contractor work. They may freelance. You may be reliant on an army of volunteers to get your work done uh, from a business perspective sometimes. And so this is going to upend just about everything in human capital, because you're going to need to think about, well, how do you even source for these roles? How do you how do you shift from perhaps a more formal job description into a description of skills that are needed? How do you contract with others in some way, some form uh, to get that get those um, tasks done? And I, I think it's going to mean that you're going to have to look at performance different, certainly talent acquisition differently. You have to look at development differently. And you're going to have to look at how you uh, how you think about opportunities for people, no matter what way they work and no matter where they work, because that's going to be one of the big challenges for organizations is to make sure that they have a fair and equitable workplace, that people receive the development and promotional opportunities that um, that others get, regardless of how uh, they've they've made arrangements to work. And that's going to take a lot of flexibility. We're used to. I think saying, well, this is our performance management system. This is our hiring process. This is our compensation schedule. And a lot of that is going to be questioned and upended. Yeah. So how much, you know, so when we, when, when the pandemic hit, we, you know, basically the economy was shut down. We went, everybody went, you know, virtual boom. Sure. And it was hard, you know, because there were people didn't want to go virtual at that point. I think, you know, two years was a long time to be virtual and now when we're coming back saying, okay, the offices are open, people are going, no, I don't, I don't want to do that. But how much of it is that, you know, that easing back in, you know, and, and maybe a year from now or two years from now, people will be more comfortable and it will be mostly in the office. You see what I'm saying? It's, mm -hmm. it, it, is it, or is it just going to be permanently, here's where we are and, and, and people ain't going to change? Well, you know, I don't have a crystal ball, but if I had to put 20 bucks on the table, I'd say you're probably always going to have um, this sort of resistance to return into the office. And, and here's why. So in years past, particularly in high demand, uh, top talent roles, particularly in the tech industry, you had companies do a great deal to help um, entice them to come and retain them. And so as you as you see in the tech world, you've got a lot of people who do not want to return. So there's, and it depends on which uh, way, particularly in tech and also in finance, what people have chosen to announce. There's a lot of resistance. I don't think that's going to go away. Here's what I do think was going to happen: the next downturn in the economy, when there's no longer the need for as many talented workers, you're going to have people scrambling for the same jobs, and they will make the concession to come in to work in a perfect in a workplace if they need to. Right now, they don't. They can go somewhere else, be paid, you know, an equivalent salary with the flexibility to work from wherever. And right now, they're in the driver's seat. But, you know, the, I use this pendulum um, analogy often. Things shift. But right now, I think that's what we have. What you're talking about is that we're virtually at full employment. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the demand for workers is very high, but particularly on certain skills that's right. um, that, are, that are difficult to fill. And so, therefore... 
this level of flexibility now, instead of it being sort of icing on the cake, as you were describing with the tech companies, think ping pong tables and everybody can wear jeans and t-shirts. Now is, you know, that flex, that level of flexibility is required. But you, you made an interesting comment in there. I'm not sure that, it, which, you know, you might want to just expand upon. And that's the fairness, because when you start introducing flexibility, which is she can do this, but she can't, you know, because flexibility is kind of everybody does different things because you're trying to meet the needs of individuals. How can CHROs maintain fairness in the workplace? So I would, I would maybe just clarify, as I don't, I don't mean to to, to indicate that flexibility just means, you know, it's a come as you are party. I do think that uh, managers and teams in particular need to articulate what does a flexible work policy look like? What are the guidelines for what constitutes good teamwork? How will this team, uh, how will this team operate? And in fact, that's one of the recipes for success that you see even in those places where more of a physical presence is required. So, you know, I think it, you need to empower teams to be able to be thoughtful about how they're gonna deliver the work. And then you have to hold people accountable for addressing those norms or to stepping up uh, to do that. So this is, so that's a really good point, Rebecca, because you're not saying everybody's a free for all. You're saying bake in flexibility and write the standards such that you can operate a workplace and be fair, but then you, you make those standards flexible enough to meet the needs. That's what you're saying. I think so, because here's, here's what happens. What we know from our research and that of others is that women and people of color in particular are not as interested in returning back to the office full time. Now, there are a variety of reasons for that. There's enough in the literature around you know, the, the pressures of childcare. We haven't cracked the code on that yet. And so in many cases, there are people who would welcome maybe a return to the office if there was childcare offered on site or something that would support them. There are also, um, you know, many instances, a great article in uh, Harvard that just came out yesterday uh, with Joan Williams talking about the microaggressions that uh, people of color often suffer. And so not having to do that face-to-face -face in a physical setting is a welcome event. So the concern I would have is, and all CHROs and all, you know, CEOs are going to be thinking about this. You know, we've made such gains. It's not perfect world, but we've made a lot of gains in the last two decades in terms of representation of women and people of color in leadership ranks or in the workforce in, in general. And to lose ground there would be a shame. So that's why I think there's gonna be a real focus of a particular attentiveness to making sure that people have opportunities for advancement or to, to remain in the workforce, you know, despite whatever the challenges are and organizations that can figure that out are gonna be at a much more competitive advantage than those who don't. Yeah, so this, this strategy works better um, in some companies and in some industries and others, a la the knowledge-based industries, you know, where, you know, or IT-based industries, it works less well, you know, on a construction site or on a manufacturing line, but, or service providers. So, but, but, you know, maybe talk through how those people, you, you said, you know, flexibility, it's still going to require some level of flexibility. Um, describe what service providers and on-site providers need to be thinking about because it's not you can't just you can't mail it in from home right so are you are you specifically asking about the child care or support for them or just in general yeah just broadly i mean what what are the practices that uh chros in those industries need to do differently sure so i've spoken to a few uh who are trying to address this particular challenge and what they're trying to do is in some cases what tech companies did to lure uh, top talent in by providing almost a home-like setting. If you've ever you know, visited some of the tech headquarters, you, know, you, you can see how it's set up and there's a lot to support um, really working and almost living there in terms of the, the kinds of things that they offer to support employees. Many people who are in manufacturing environments or where there is a point of service or point of sale that it doesn't make knowledge working you know, make sense. These are folks who are going to try to think about how do you make the burden less onerous for people. So that might look like childcare, that might look like on-site, you know, healthcare, or it might look like on-site dry cleaning or hair, you know, those kinds of things that allow people to have less time that they have to be doing other things other than either at home or at work. And also they're probably going to have to rethink 
the way in which they put together, let's say, manufacturing shifts that might look like it might look like staggered shifts. It might look like job sharing. It might also look like having that very basic team conversation around why they need to get uh, certain procedures in place so that they can deliver, you know, the whatever the, the business metrics are. But I think it starts with being honest with a group of adults in that team and saying, these are the things we need to accomplish. How best can we do that given the makeup of this team and the challenges that they have? I think it comes down to the same kinds of conversations, no matter what the setting. We're talking with Dr. Rebecca Ray about uh, the new hybrid workplace. We're going to take a short break and we'll be right back with more. As war rages in Ukraine, the conference board is closely monitoring the situation and producing timely and relevant content on a daily basis that will help the business community navigate this global geopolitical unrest. What will the impact be on oil prices, food prices, our supply chain? And what about cybersecurity? How will this conflict impact the way your organization does business around the world? And how will you communicate this crisis to customers and employees? We're gathering the very latest content on our website. Just head to conference-board.org and find trusted insights to help you and your team lead with confidence. Welcome back to CEO Perspectives. I'm your host, Steve Odlin, the CEO of the Conference Board, and we're talking today with Dr. Rebecca Ray, about the flexible workplace. Rebecca is the head of the Human Capital Center of the Conference Board. So Rebecca, in this new world, how much flexibility do people really want, workers, employees really want? How much flexibility is just right? How much is too much? How much is not enough? You know, where's the Goldilocks factor here? Well, Steve, I, I don't mean to return to my consulting days, but it really does depend. So, you know, the 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 general consensus is that when all this shakes out, it may take a couple of years or so before it does, but most tend to believe that roughly, you know, one in four, one in five are going to be remote all the time. And one in four, one in five are going to be, uh, you know, on site all the time. And the rest are going to be some combination of hybrid. And, and I'm not sure that there's a magic formula. You hear the two, three combination tossed around a lot, but I, but I think that that assumes certain things. That assumes that there's a compelling reason to go back to the workplace. And I'm not sure that corporations have, generally speaking, done a great job of articulating why. Now, you and I have talked about this, and there are some great reasons to return. Um, but I do think that uh, people are going to need to have a reason to come to the office. Now, maybe there's ways to think about this. So I've spoken with some CHROs, and what they're doing is, is putting sort of innovation days together, or they're putting together celebration days, or they're putting, to get today, putting together days where... Uh, mentors meet their new uh, prospective mentees or other things that that perhaps lend themselves more to a face-to-face -face environment. And I think you have to be thoughtful about that. I mean, nobody is clamoring to get back to the workforce because they've missed the commute or they needed to get at that color printer that just is so fabulous at the workplace. That's, you've got to have other reasons and there are many. So for example, you know, you think about culture. I think there are reasons why you'd want to have people back in the office, particularly people who are early in career and new to the company. You know, they need to have an understanding of what is this company about? What is its mission? Who are these people? And there's a lot to be said for, you know, we're human beings, we're social animals, and there's a lot to be said for seeing people and getting to know them because it's so easy sometimes to be misinterpreted in an email or even in a disintermediated video call. And you know, if you trust someone because you know them a little bit better, you tend to give them the benefit of the doubt and not think that you know there's some unintended intent that was sent. Yeah, and you know, ninety percent of communication is nonverbal, so you know, you, you really, you really do sometimes need to see that. You know, when you talk to CHROs and CEOs, they more than uh, the staff members think that the in-person experience is important. And when you talk to them, they talk about you know, trying to maintain uh, the culture, as you mentioned, but uh, innovation and teamwork and, and, and all of that. And it's like, it's, so when, you, when you're talking about how do you present this and make your case, you know, you really do have to get into these areas, don't you? And, and really describe the benefits, not only to the company, but also to, to the, the individual. Person. That's right. I mean, if you remember the old days, um, which you know, seems a lifetime ago, but in the old days, we used to have an offsite once in a while. And we'd plan for it, we'd structure it. We knew who was speaking. We knew what we hoped to accomplish. We knew what the takeaways were supposed to be. And we knew how we would advance the conversation around how the company continues to thrive. I think we need to think about returning to the office in somewhat the same way. 
why are we returning? You know, are there are there landmark events that we could say to people, we're going to have um, we're going to have a, a time set aside for all of us to go through the customer service uh, responses or the feedback from our customers, and we're going to brainstorm around what could make our products more compelling or more innovative, or similar things like that that people understand. I'm going there because, as opposed to I'm going to put up with the commute and a schlog and this and that. you know what I mean it's just we got to have a reason, and I think people. I think people just naturally gravitate toward um, a, a purpose for something. And I, I think it's possible. It just takes a little bit more intentionality. Yeah, and that, this is tough for CHROs and CEOs and really all business leaders because, you know, what seemed obvious pre-pandemic, well, you come in because, you know, that's because you this is how you do business, that's right. um, is not necessarily obvious today. And, you know, in some of these workplaces, you're hearing astounding numbers, percentages of their workers that have been hired, you know, sight unseen. I mean, you know, in two dimensions, you know, via video and they haven't ever met them in person. So you've got what, 35, 40% of some, some workforces, a lot of people that, that haven't experienced this before. It, you know, this is, this really takes, you said intentionality, but it, it and it, it's a great word. I mean, it, it really does take thinking through in a different context to the way that we've always done business. That's right. And I, and I think leaders need support here. You know, we're expecting an awful lot from leaders. You're expecting them to be uh, aware of, you know, personal challenges or, you know, anxiety or mental health challenges, whatever, and sort of be this end all and be all. I'm not sure that's possible. I, I do think that leaders come from a good place most of the time, set aside, you know, an, an aberration here and there. But I think most people care about their workers. They care about them as a whole person. You have to work, I think, a little harder to get to make sure that you still have that connection and to reach out more intentionally, if you will. Because at the end of the day, people are loyal to people. They might also be loyal to the company, but they are very loyal to people. And if you feel as though you have a caring, supportive manager, that's hard to leave. And that's gonna keep someone perhaps from listening to the siren song of a recruiter. So, you know, I think those things are important. And especially to your point, you've got a lot of people who are new, many of whom are entering the workplace. They don't have a, what it used to look like picture. All they know is they've got a Zoom connection with people and it's easier to be connected if occasionally you can, you can be with them. By the same token, I recognize that's just simply not possible for a lot of talented people that an organization would like to, uh, you know, to attract and, and retain. And so there we just have to need to figure out what does this, this experience need to look like for them to be just as loyal and just as productive? Yeah. And, you know, the siren song of the recruiter is, uh, you know, is not as attractive as, uh, as as people thought it was. I mean, you're seeing some. Some boomerangs. Reported, yeah. I mean, well, you're seeing what, 70 percent of millennials saying, gosh, I wish I hadn't left that job. I really miss the other job. It, <laughs> the grass is not always greener. Whatever metaphor you want to use or whatever saying you want to use, but people are going, you know, maybe, maybe we shouldn't be bouncing so much. Well, that's possible. Uh, I think organizations also need to be sort of open to the returning individual. Um, And I'm not saying that should be in every case, but I think we need to be thoughtful about it. You know, I think the uh, management consulting companies have were early to the party on this in having sort of an alumni network and making it okay to come back and not to have the stigma that it might have in earlier times or at other companies. And that allows, I think, people the the grace with which to return. Those are sometimes people who return with not only organizational knowledge and a culture fit, but quite often bring back with them some of the accounts that they might have been, you know, front and center on. So I think there's a reason to consider it. And, you know, I think also millennials are are learning what many of us have learned over time. And we could do yeah. that face-to-face or remotely if we can tell those stories. Yeah, it is interesting that uh, everything that you're hearing about millennials, you heard about the baby boomers before that and Generation X. Every generation is the same thing. Yeah, so it's not really millennials. It's it's really generational and it's just a cycle that people go through. But, you know, you, you've you talked about this in the past and, and, and you made a couple points today, but you know, when you when you look at companies' engagement surveys, why why do I work here? What do I like? You know, what drives engagement? It, it always comes down to people. It's not the furniture, you know, or the food. No. It's, it's always the people. And that's the people around them, uh, friends, you know, colleagues, supervisors, and so forth. A- and, you know, when you're in a virtual environment, that changes. How, how now, when, when people, when leaders are thinking about a hybrid environment, 
How do you capture all of that human interaction? So leaders are gonna to need to be supported uh, to be effective no matter what the scenario, whether it's hybrid, which is the most difficult one, you know, all remote is one thing or all in person is one thing, but the toughest one is when you have a foot in both worlds. But leaders have to make sure that they have the skills to be effective in both and also to be fair in both. And I, I say this knowing that I don't think any leader starts out by saying, how can I, how can I you know, be unfair or how can I take away an opportunity from someone? It's human nature to be maybe thinking about someone you see a little bit more often and suggest to that person that he or she join a, a task force or a, a special project. You're gonna have to be really intentional about making sure that you check in with all of your employees, maybe a couple levels down. You know, I know you're a big advocate of the um, uh, skip level meetings, but you need to ask people, how is it going? Or just a, a casual conversation around something that you both are passionate about or, you know, something that their child's experiencing in school, or maybe they've mentioned in the past some of their aspirational goals. You have to do those kinds of things because I think you lose the connection. And once that starts to erode, it's a little harder to build. So being intentional, I think, is going to be really important for, for managers and they're going to need support. This is this does not come naturally, especially when leaders are now expected to monitor for signs of distress, and uh, and then to be expected to um, connect the organizational assets to support this person. That's usually in the purview of someone who's a trained professional. But we ask that now of leaders, and we don't. I don't think that's going to stop. The good news is, in the last uh, research that we just did, three quarters of people think that they work for a caring and empathetic manager. They also said, I think about a quarter of them, um, that they didn't feel that their manager was uh, supporting their mental health needs. And I think that's the wrong question. I'm, I'm not sure we should put that on leaders. I think they should be attentive and I think they should be the first you know, canary in the coal mine, but I don't think it's their job to fix. Yeah, and, and the mental health thing is, you know, is that's probably a, a big umbrella for you know, well -be worker well-being and, yeah. and, and, and work-life balance and a lot of other things. Um, but you know, this, this hybrid, the hybrid world, it, it, you know, you were saying it before it was all in person. So that's easy to, that's easier to, you know, program or all, um, you know, uh, all remote, but in a hybrid world, it's not all hybrid either. You do have some people who are there every day, you know, uh, it help desk people, uh, you know, whatever. And you have people that are fully remote. And then you have people that are in two, three days a week. So the hybrid world is runs the entire range yes. of all of this, which makes it even more complex. And you know, I think your point, which is uh, which is to every individual, you know, you have to get down. Leaders have to get down and understand every individual. You're, that really is the case because there is there are no two people who are experiencing their work the same way. That's exactly right. Nor are they experiencing all of the external factors over which you have virtually no control, whether that's, you know, a, a working mother who's very concerned that she can't get, you know, a formula for her baby, or that's someone who's suffered and still is grieving from COVID loss. So you're going to have not only just different types of things for a long time, people are going to go through all kinds of machinations over time. And what might have worked at one point maybe needs to change. And they have to have a conversation with their manager around, this is what I need now to be productive. What can we do here? So I think that's going to be the, the superpower of a good manager is the level of sensitivity and flexibility. And by extension, he or she is going to need the support of the organization to do that. So we're in a permanent hybrid world i think so permanent in the sense that it and and it will morph over time and change but that's going to require leadership attentiveness and empathy like never before and that's going to have to translate into flexibility and that flexibility is going to need to be supported by chros and ceos it's going to be need policies around that you know in and guidelines around that so you know, the complexity of, of the work world has, has changed forever and is going to require a lot of attention over the next few years. I think that's right, Steve. And I, I do think that some of this will get codified over time. But for a long time here, we're going to be, you know, sailing the ship before we really have it all charted out. So, so I think the watchword here is, you know, if people can be other-centered enough to allow space for people and if they can be flexible, um, 
and still keep their eye on what needs to get done because that's the mission of the company, yeah. be all right. Yeah. Dr. Rebecca Ray, thanks for being with us. It's a pleasure, Steve. Thank you. And thanks to all of you for listening in to CEO Perspectives. Every week, I'll be joined by a prominent thought leader to provide insights on the issues of our time. We'll cover leading topics in geopolitics, economics, human capital, public policy, environmental social governance, marketing communications, and more. Please share CEO Perspectives with everybody you know. I know that they're going to want to listen. I'm Steve Odlin, and this series is brought to you by the Conference Board. You've been listening to a podcast from the Conference Board, your source of trusted insights for what's ahead. For the latest insights to help guide your business through this time of geopolitical unrest, we have daily and relevant updates on our website at conference-board.org.